Well, it's little wonder that smart shoppers everywhere take time out to pause and refresh. And where else but in the fountain where they serve ice-cold Coca-Cola? I've been thinking a lot about the symbols that we see in everyday American life. Whether it's driving down the street, playing on a screen, or in the palm of your hand, one of the most defining aspects of the United States is its consumer culture. A lot of our national identity comes from a shared exposure to the great touchstones of American culture, brands. This got me thinking, what are the most iconic brands in America today? I'm curious about your own cultural experience with brands, whether it's in the United States or anywhere else across the globe. What are the companies that you associate with your own culture and what are your experiences with the companies that we're talking about in this video? Coca-Cola is unquestionably iconic. Go to the refrigerator and get an ice cold Coca-Cola. You'll find it so refreshing. The original recipe for Coca-Cola was created in 1886 by a pharmacist as a sort of health drink. Ice cold Coca-Cola quenches your thirst. Coca-Cola is pure, wholesome refreshment. Over the course of the last century, Coke has become much more than just a drink. They have done an exceptional job at licensing their branding across an array of random products which bring in over $1 billion in annual retail sales. Coke is famous for their incredibly iconic marketing campaigns, but how did it start? Here's an original Coca-Cola ad from 1890, which features the clunky tagline of refreshing and invigorating. In the year 1900, Coke would do one of the earliest examples of celebrity marketing through their collaboration with Hilda Clark, whose face could be seen on all kinds of random Coke branded products. This must have worked pretty well for them because by 1925, they ran their first official billboard, which flaunted Coca-Cola's popularity. The famous Norman Rockwell painted six different artworks for Coca-Cola between 1928 and 1935. The most famous of these is Out Fishing, which depicts a young American boy fishing on a tree stump, a accompanied only by his dog and a good old Coca-Cola. This 1935 painting is hard to separate from the context of the Great Depression, though it definitely captures more of the simplicity of the time over its suffering. Rockwell himself said, I paint life as I would like it to be. Given his age, the boy from the painting likely would have ended up fighting in World War II, but don't worry, your old friend Coke's got you covered. America prepares. All America alters its pattern of life and work to meet the demand for protection. This 1944 painting mixes the iconic wartime propaganda of the era with a quintessential American company. It's remarkable how well Coca-Cola was able to entrench itself inside of the picturesque American life. Coca-Cola in your refrigerator, ice cold and ready to serve all the time. It's a wonderful way to say to folks, so glad you came. By 1946, the war was over and the American people were focused on other things, mainly what you can see in this billboard. This might be my favorite Coke advertisement of all time because of its sheer simplicity. These three paintings form a sort of unofficial trilogy in my eyes, showcasing the evolution of the lives of men from the greatest generation. From the struggles of the Great Depression, through the horrors of war, and into an idealistic America where you can worry about things like romance and buying a girl a Coke. Coca-Cola put you at your spark. Best. Here's another advertisement that inserts Coca-Cola into picturesque American life. The woman shown in the ad, Mary Alexander, is actually the first black person to appear on Coke advertisements. I feel like we don't usually see black Americans portrayed in this sort of romanticized mid-century art style, so I thought it was interesting to get that from Coca-Cola of all places. Before we transition to what I would call the modern era of Coke advertisements, I wanted to add another plotline to the story. Back in 1931, Coca-Cola ran their first Christmas advertisement campaign featuring jolly old St. Nick. Apparently, the general concept around the campaign was to counteract the perception of Coke as a drink exclusively for hot weather. Santa Claus had appeared sporadically in some Coke advertisements throughout the 1920s, which took a lot of inspiration from the artwork of Thomas Nast. Nast started drawing Santa Claus as Civil War propaganda back in the 1860s, so his interpretation was quite different from the Santa that we know today. Soon enough, Coke was looking for a more uplifting version of Santa Claus. They commissioned a Michigan-born artist by the name of Haddon Sunblom. Sunblom's interpretation was heavily inspired by Clement Clark Moore's poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, also known as Twas the Night Before Christmas. This version of Santa Claus was warmer and more inviting in a way that fit what Coca-Cola was looking for. Coke is actually largely responsible for redefining Santa Claus as an American cultural figure.
Some people like to say that Christmas is all about corporate profit and consumerism, which I don't really agree with, but our modern conception of a figure as ubiquitous as Santa Claus being so directly tied to one of the biggest companies in world history is certainly noteworthy. There's nothing like a Coca-Cola, nothing like a Coke. In 1971, the Coca-Cola company aired the famous I'd Like to Buy the World a Coke commercial, arguably the most famous television advertisement in world history. This ad features young people from all around the world singing together on an Italian hilltop. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing, sing with me. This iconic commercial is the brainchild of Bill Backer, creative director of Coca-Cola for the McCann Erickson Advertising Agency. According to Coca-Cola's official website, Backer was flying to London to write new radio commercials for the company when heavy fog forced the plane to land in Shannon, Ireland. All of the passengers were understandably grumpy, but by the next day, Backer noticed some of the angriest passengers laughing and telling stories over a bottle of Coke. Backer recalled, in that moment, I saw a bottle of Coke in a whole new light. I began to see a bottle of Coca-Cola as more than a drink that refreshed 100 million people a day in almost every corner of the globe. So I began to see the familiar words, let's have a Coke, as more than an invitation to pause for a refreshment. They were actually a subtle way of saying, let's keep each other company for a little while. And I knew they were being said all over the world as I sat there in Ireland. So that was the basic idea, to see Coke not as it was originally designed to be, a liquid refresher, but as a tiny bit of commonality between all peoples, a universally liked formula that would help to keep them company for a few minutes. This quote really speaks volumes about the evolution of Coca-Cola from just a regular drink into something more. After numerous delays and a ballooning budget, the famous commercial finally aired and the rest is history. As far as I know, the commercial ran on almost every country of the world that, that speaks English and, um, and they all understood it. That it was a product saying we can be a little social catalyst that can bring people together, talk things over, and sometimes communications get better if you're just sitting over a bottle of Coke and looking people in the eye. I'm sure everyone remembers the share a Coke with X campaign that popped off a few years ago. These two always seemed remarkably similar to me in spirit. Instead of buying the world a Coke, how about everybody get their own personalized Coke and then share it on social media? With the company as old and deeply rooted in not only American culture, but the global culture as a whole, romanticizing the basic act of sharing a Coke with somebody is simple but brilliant. Considering its longevity and cultural influence, dare I say Coca-Cola is more American than apple pie. I'm going to show you how McDonald's builds a, a Big Mac sandwich. This nine-layer gastronomic indulgence is known as a Big Mac. McDonald's was founded in 1948 by two brothers named Richard and Maurice McDonald in San Bernardino, California. A lot of aspects of how the original restaurant functioned might seem normal by today's standards, but they were actually very innovative for the time. They were primarily focused on hamburgers, milkshakes, and fries. McDonald's new Big Mac sandwich for the bigger than average appetite. <laughs> The burgers were prepared ahead of time and kept warm under a heat lamp, which significantly reduced the wait time for customers. McDonald's also employed a self-service station instead of waiters, which was certainly a change. A kitchen appliance salesman named Ray Kroc was impressed by the innovative business model and decided to buy the franchising rights. By 1961, he would outright own the company. Thus, the modern fast food restaurant was born. What's most impressive about the McDonald's business model is its remarkable consistency. Operating on a fundamental, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. What has evolved significantly, however, is their marketing. To McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's. The famous golden arches were actually thought up by the McDonald's brothers themselves who wanted their restaurant to stand out to hungry customers. 
An architect by the name of Stanley Clark Meston designed the original location. The first iteration of what would become the logo that we know today debuted in 1961, and it's pretty funny to look back at in retrospect. This minimalist artwork is supposed to show the view of a McDonald's restaurant from the side with two golden arches forming an M and a slanted roof between them. Fast forward to the modern day and the golden arches are much more of a logo than actual restaurant design. Ronald McDonald debuted in 1963 at a frankly terrifying first appearance, which is far removed from the one that we're so familiar with today. I kid you not, one of the articles that I read while researching for this video literally said, today the fashion police would be blasting sirens, but the 1960s were a more colorful and accepting time, at least for clowns. No kidding. Apparently, marketing executives considered turning Ronald McDonald into a cowboy given the popularity of westerns, but ultimately decided against it. The original Ronald was played by a local weatherman named Willard Scott, who was hired for three TV spots in the Washington, D.C. area, though he was unceremoniously left behind when Mr. McDonald became a national figure. I'm gonna need some energy, and we know there's no better way than with a delicious McDonald's pure beef hamburger! and a triple thick mcdonald's shake really great go together scott claims that he was fired for his weight as mcdonald's was seeking an extremely active ronald though various actors have worn the boots over the years mcdonald's doesn't really like to acknowledge that when asked by the ap how many actors had portrayed the clown an executive responded there's only one ronald hamburger university with ronald mcdonald good morning class good, good morning ronald, ronald. Today's subject, the Hamburglar. In the 70s, McDonald's would introduce McDonald Land into their marketing. This fantasy world would introduce other McDonald's icons like the Hamburglar and Grimace, who has been the talk of the town lately. This June, we're all invited to the party with a special shake to celebrate. Get Grimace's birthday shake when you order his birthday meal only at McDonald's. What's your secret? The McDonald's company apparently planned to collaborate with the creators of a popular television character named H.R. Puffin Stuff. The collaboration fell through and the Puffin Stuff team won a legal case against McDonald's stating that they had taken heavy inspiration on character design and even poached various employees of the company for the McDonald's campaign. Soon, the world's most famous clown even made it into the world of video games in the 80s and 90s. As McDonald's became the largest restaurant in the world, it managed to spread itself across the globe and invade two previously unattainable markets, China and the Soviet Union. Soviets are used to standing in long lines for just about anything, but for Big Macs and fries, it's a first. This was peak Ronald McDonald. You could not get away from this guy. He ended up having a series of direct-to-VHS films made about him. Oh wow, guys, I had no idea! Despite all the success, a big turning point for McDonald's marketing was Super Size Me. Double quarter pounder with cheese. More calories than anything. There it is, a little bit of heaven. This documentary follows a man who decided to eat nothing but McDonald's hamburgers for a month, resulting in rapid weight gain and high cholesterol. In only 30 days of eating nothing but McDonald's, I gained 24 and a half pounds. My liver turned to fat and my cholesterol shot up 65 points. My body fat percentage went from 11 to 18%, still below the national average of 22% for men and 30% for women. I nearly doubled my risk of coronary heart disease, making myself twice as likely to have heart failure. I felt depressed and exhausted most of the time, my mood swung on a dime, and I craved this food more and more when I ate it, and got massive headaches when I didn't. This was a marketing nightmare. Suddenly, we saw Ronald trying to repair the McDonald's image through the Go Active campaign, which advertised exercise and healthier McDonald's options. Clearly, Ronald had the power to do anything. What happened? How did a character who was so famous he went from being a brand mascot to a cultural icon just suddenly vanish? Creepy clown sightings are happening across the country and it's no laughing matter. I'm terrified of clowns, so 
I hope it doesn't happen to me. 2016 was a weird time, man. I'm not going to attribute the disappearance of Ronald McDonald entirely to the supposed killer clown epidemic. Clearly, the space that clowns occupy in popular culture had changed significantly since Ronald McDonald's debut. Between real life figures such as John Wayne Gacy and fictional ones like Pennywise, clowns have become more of a scary Halloween costume than children's entertainment. A lot of people seem to think that the McDonald's Corporation had been looking for a way out for a while and this was just an easy exit point. You could still follow Ronald McDonald on Instagram though, where he occasionally documents his exile. Nothing can stop me, I'm all away. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Back in July, I managed to escape this screen that I live inside of and found myself in beautiful Sedona, Arizona. This is the most beautiful place I've ever been to. While we were there, a friend of mine noticed a McDonald's with no golden arches and instead blue ones. Turns out this is apparently the only blue McDonald's in the world. Sedona is of course known for its breathtaking scenery. Beyond the actual nature itself, I remember being surprised by just how cohesive the buildings around the town looked. Turns out they're all required by law to adhere to a very specific aesthetic, which apparently doesn't include the normal McDonald's logo. Thus, when a local business owner wanted to open a McDonald's in 1998, the one and only Blue McDonald's was born. As a Floridian, I'm well acquainted with the world's biggest McDonald's in Orlando, which means that I've driven by it a million times and ate at it once. This McDonald's is three stories tall and has a floor area of 19,000 square feet, complete with pizza, pasta, cake, Belgian waffles, and an arcade because they can, apparently. If anything screams America, it's this. At the end of the day, our shared experiences are what form our national identity. What are your experiences with these brands or any brands for that matter? And how do you think they affect our culture? I'd love to hear what you think in the comment section down below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing, or even supporting me on Patreon. A little bit of help really goes a long way.